Hi, everybody. Kristen Cooper, your mortgage advisor here. So glad that you've joined us today. I have Bill Angrove here, and he's with um, Asset Prevention. And we're going to be talking today specifically on 1031 exchanges. I've gotten a lot more questions about this the last couple of years. And so I really wanted to record this video, answer your questions. If we talk about stuff today and you need more information on it or you have additional questions, please reach out. I want to make sure that I get that information to you. So without further ado, thank you so much, Bill, for being here today. I appreciate you jumping on here. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to our conversation. Awesome. So really, it's just going to be a conversation today and kind of talking about the program. So maybe if you can start just doing a high overview of what is a 1031 exchange, when should people consider it? Sure. Uh, Asset Preservation is a national qualified intermediary for 1031 exchanges. So anytime someone's still selling or planning on selling a piece of an investment property, uh, this part of the tax code, Section 1031, allows them to sell that property to further taxes, both state and federal and buy a new investment property anywhere in the United States. Our company's been doing this for over 30 years nationwide. We're actually one of the largest qualified intermediaries in the United States, and I've been with them uh, for over 25 years. And what I do is teach, market, educate CPAs, attorneys, commercial brokers, realtors, lenders like yourself and investors about using the tax code to sell their investment property and defer those taxes on a state and federal level. Yeah, you guys have been amazing. I've used you guys for a long time and I so appreciate working with you. And I would say they're, you know, all exchange companies are not created equally. So that's why I elaborate on that a little bit. So who would need to consider a 1031 exchange? When would this come into play? <clears throat> Anytime someone is planning on selling a property that's not their primary residence. So single family rental house, duplex, triplex, retail, office, industrial, land, ag land, any type of property that's not a primary residence, they could sell that property, especially if they have a significant amount of capital gains. Um, I usually like to tell people you're going to probably lose about 30% of your equity in state and federal taxes. Now, that's not an exact number, uh, but we always recommend you talk to your tax person, work out your numbers to see what it's going to be uh, if you don't do an exchange. And if I have a property, it's a current investment property, and I have capital gains that I want to avoid, and I do a 1031 exchange, so I'm selling my property, I'm putting it into another property, can you tell us the qualifications of the new property? What's required? Sure. A couple of things. Number one, um, you'll hear the term like kind in discussing uh, exchanges, and that's probably, probably the biggest misunderstood item of 1031s is you can sell a rental house and buy an office building. So like for like in a 1031 means any type of property that's held for trade or business or held for investment. So what we're seeing actually a lot of, Kristen, is a lot of people are, uh, the boomers are tired of the T's, as I like to say, tenants, toilets, termites, trash, and taxes. They're prior, tired of the property management. So they'll sell three or four properties at a time, consolidate all that equity and, and buy a new property out of state. Uh, maybe they eventually want to move there uh, as their primary residence. And that's an important note is you cannot buy a property right away as an, a primary residence. It has to be held for trade or business or held for investment. The question is how long? And of course, the IRS regulations don't give you any set timeline of how long you need to hold a property for before you do your next exchange or maybe convert it to a primary residence. Some tax advisors say a minimum of a year, more conservatively hold that new property for a minimum of a couple of years. So that's a, a one important item is what is like kind in exchange. Secondarily is the numbers. Um, you'll hear people say buy of equal or greater value when you do an exchange. That's not in the regulations. That is, if you don't want to pay any taxes, you do two things. Number one, you reinvest all of your exchange proceeds. So that's your sales price minus your closing cost commissions minus your outstanding debt. That would be your proceeds. That's the money that's actually held by our company in between your sale and purchase. That's kind of see that in the graphic that you have up on the screen. You see the money going from the sale to us. So you want to, re, number one, reinvest all of those proceeds from the sale. And number two, acquire a property that has the same or greater loan balance. So if you have that now standing loan balance of $200,000 on your old property, you want to have a new loan balance that's going to be $200,000 or more in the replacement property for full tax deferral. Or another way I like to say that if you take your sales price of $500,000 and you back out closing costs and commissions, that's your escrow and title fees and commission to your realtor, whatever your net sales price, that's what you want to go buy for or greater. And again, you can sell three properties and buy one. You can sell one and buy five if you want to. So it's pretty flexible. 
That's really cool. Actually, that's an interesting way to look at it. So let's say that I have three properties in California and let's say between the three properties, I net 800,000. As long as I take that 800,000 and I go buy, let's say a four unit property, as long as that's 800,000 or more, then I can do that. I can combine all three of them into one property, even if I don't take out a new loan or do I need to take out a new loan or can I just well, if you've use got a loan, If you have an $800,000 property, or uh, well, first of all, what would be the debt? So you've got to replace the debt also. So if you have a two hundred thousand dollar loan, three hundred thousand dollar loan, you need to replace that. So it's the eight hundred thousand it. net proceeds plus the debt on top of that. That's okay. the number you'd want to work with. That's so no loans. If I have no loans and I have eight hundred thousand, I'm netting. I don't have to get another loan. But if I have eight hundred thousand, oh. I'm netting and two hundred thousand dollar loan. It needs to be a million dollars. Right. Okay. If that you have sense. an eight hundred thousand dollar net and no loan. And you want to go buy a $1.5 million property and get a loan for the balance. Of course, you can do that or insert cash to offset whatever you'd like to do. Perfect. Um, another question for you with the 1031 exchange, I, I get questions on this, is I inherited a property and it was a rental property that I inherited. How does that mm -hmm. apply? Well, um, there's a, it depends. And of course, I'm always going to tell people you need to talk to your tax person because everybody's situation is different. First scenario is they inherited it 10 years ago. They probably have some gain from what, when they inherited it. But if they inherited it a month ago, you know, they usually receive the value of that property. It's what's called a step up in basis. So mom and dad bought it for hundred grand umpteen years ago, and now it's worth a million. Typically the kids are going to inherit it at that million dollar value. There's no real gain that you need to do if you're going to sell the property or no exchange needed because you're, there's no gain. You bought it, you get it at the million dollar value. Yeah, I get that question a lot. So I'm glad that you elaborated on that because a lot of people sure. think they have to go through an exchange in that type of situation. The classic is we get to the three siblings that uh, inherited the property 10 years ago. And one of the siblings is living in the mom and dad's old house rent free. And they don't want to sell the property because they're living there rent free. And the other two are like, hey, let's get rid of this. We want to go our separate ways. And so that can be a, a legal issue that they have to deal with. Yeah, exactly. So really with the 1031 exchange, if you have a rental property and you're wanting to avoid capital gains, this would be the direction that you need to move forward with. If you don't use an exchange and you sell your property, and I've had this happen too, where I'll have a client come to me later on, they sold a property and uh, they weren't aware of capital gains uh, until later. And so they ended up getting a bill and, you know, IRS and all that kind of stuff. So it's really important that if you're not sure that you reach out to a tax professional and that you find out if there's going to be capital gains, because there's a lot of misconception around capital gains. And a lot of people think, you know, if I had it as a rental property or, or a primary, or, you know, and then it was a rental for part of time and primary, as long as I lived in it two years, I for sure don't have to pay capital gains. And that's not the case. There's a calculation that has to be done, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. So it's really important that you speak with the tax professional to find out if you do have capital gains and then, you know, consider doing an exchange. And let's talk maybe briefly on exchanges where you are selling one property in one state and then purchasing in another state. How would that work with an exchange company? Yeah, um, popular states that we're seeing people exchange into, you know, Idaho used to be number one. I would say number one right now is Tennessee. Uh, I'd still go into Idaho, but people are figuring out it's a little cold in Idaho uh, than they thought. Um, of course, Nevada, Texas, Florida, uh, a big one these days we're hearing is the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, we're seeing uh, people going to. So uh, the important thing is, is California doesn't forget that you have gain here. So let's say you are selling in California and buying in Nevada, which is a zero tax state. California has a clawback law that says, you have to continue to file a California informational tax return while you own that property out of state. Because if and when you do sell that property in Nevada, California says, we want the tax on that money you deferred from that gain uh, five years ago or from the exchange five years ago. So they follow you. And if you don't pay the tax or make that uh, uh, informational return for California, they're gonna send you a tax bill for the gain that you deferred. So that's important to understand. So again, if you exchange out of California, California does not forget, and you're going to have to owe them eventually, unless you die or you keep doing more exchanges. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people uh, don't think that that's the case, and then they get the notice. <laughs> it, California will follow you. But it's important to know because a lot of people don't realize that you can do an exchange out of California. So you can. There's just ways that you need to talk to your tax professional to ensure that it's done correctly. You know, and I want to bring up another point that you, you mentioned a minute ago is... 
people have, let's say they've had a rental for six years and they think they can move back into it for two, make it their primary and pocket either the 250 or $500,000 exclusion. Post 2009, which there was a change in law says, you may only be eligible for two years out of the six years that you've owned it of gain or eight years in my example, uh, instead of getting 250, you may be only entitled to 100 grand of gain out tax free under section code 121. It's important that, that you talk to your tax person and run the numbers like you mentioned. Yeah, thank you for elaborating on that. Because I, 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 like I said, I've had the horror stories come to me later and they, they had no clue. So that's why I'm always doing these videos to send out to my database and hope that they watch them <laughs> so that they're yeah. prepared, you know, and that they get all the right information. So maybe if you can briefly just talk about the process. So I have a rental property mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about it. What would be the next steps? And then if I do do the exchange, how would that take part? What's the process? Sure. Like? Um, the first thing is that's where we would get involved in the front side is whether uh, it's, a, it's a realtor, a CPA attorney, or someone like yourself is have the client call us, go to our website. We've got YouTube videos to learn about the process uh, up front. The next thing would be to put the property on the market, find a buyer, open escrow, just like you normally would sell in your primary residence. Typically, we get engaged about a week or two weeks before close of escrow. So we would uh, reach out, get the client's information, get the prelim and the purchase contract sent over to us. We would prepare their exchange documents and send them to the title company handling the closing. They can either sign at the title company or they can sign via DocuSign with us, uh, such that when they close, the, as I mentioned earlier, that's the day zero on the horizontal line that you see on the screen. That's the beginning of the exchange. So when they close, the proceeds are sent to us, as I mentioned. And the first time I need to be aware of is that blue line. That's the identification period. The regulations stipulate you must identify in writing unambiguously the potential property or properties that you're considering buying by midnight of the 45th day of the exchange. The total timeline you have to close on that new property or properties is 180 days from that same closing date. Now, you're not required to wait until day 45 or wait until day 180. You can close your new property the day after you close your old property. These are just the maximum timelines that you're given. So when you're ready to close the new property, we're going to wire the funds back to the title company handling your purchase, whether it be in California or outside the U.S. or outside um, California. Uh, we'll wire those funds, the closing attorney, escrow, whoever it may be, and then you wind up with a deed to the replacement property. In essence, you're selling an investment property, you're buying another investment property within those parameters. Thank you. I was muted. So yeah, I do think that um, that's super important that people understand that identification period, because if you go past that, you now are paying capital gains. So it's really important to understand that you have timeframes that you have to meet. And so digging in deeper in there, and this is your website um, for your company. So this is mm -hmm. where, and there's a ton, like you were saying, there's a ton of information on here. Um, what I love too, and you just pointed out that this is on here is that you have a capital gains calculator here. So mm -hmm. it kind of give you a rough estimate if you haven't reached out to a tax professional or you don't know and you just kind of want to see maybe at least you can go in and kind of run this to get an idea of what you're looking at. But it does have all the different exchange types and all the basics here, too. So I would encourage people if you're you know, needing to do this or thinking about it or just in the initial stages, you can go to the website and look here. And then when you're ready, reach out to um, Bill and go over, you know, setting up all the information that you need so that you can start that exchange process. Um, and then, Bill, your email is bill at APIE, right, exchange? Yep. 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 So instead of info, it'll be bill at the API exchange.com. And uh, just let them know, hey, I have questions, or this is what I'm thinking about, or we're ready and we want to start the process. Where do we start? Because you want to make sure you're with the right company as well. So this has been super informational. I know that this is going to help a lot of people. So I appreciate, I know you're super busy, especially right now. So making sure that um, they have the information is super important to me. So I appreciate you jumping on here and going over all the information. Anytime. Today. I kind of give out my cell phone number. Yes, please do. Yeah, 916-832-1031. 1031. Perfect. Well, thank you, Bill. Appreciate you jumping yeah. on here and hope you have thank a you. wonderful day. Thank you.